All right, I know it's late in the day, so I'm not going to tell you anything about complicated numbers. Instead, I would like to ask you to use your imagination. First, imagine that you are somewhere in Inereti, beautiful scenery. Next, imagine that you are this little child growing up in a village somewhere there, 300 households and maybe a small school. Okay, now try to imagine your teachers in that, in that school. They would be mostly women and maybe even your mom or your elder sister. And they will be waking up in the morning to mill their cows, to do the house chores, whatever they have to do, and then take the walk to the school to teach a class or two. Now imagine further that you reach the age of 15, maybe 16, and you look at your class and it gets emptier and emptier. You know, the guys, maybe they have something better to do. And the girls, the girls have an altogether different strategy. They decide that maybe time has come for them to establish a family. They, look, they are on the market. So then you ask yourself, why study? You know, school is not so much fun, as you can see. And studying for the sake of getting into a college, well, maybe also that is not a very good idea because you don't have any money. Your parents will not be able to pay your tuition and you will never be able to, to get into a good school. There are government scholarships, that's true. That works for some people, but again, you would need to hire private tutors. And without private tutors, you will not do well in the national exams that Georgia has and you will not qualify for a government scholarship. So you are basically back to square one. You are back to your village and back to living on, in agriculture, in subsistence agriculture, which is basically about having another generation lost in another cycle of misery and poverty. Now, I'm not here to tell you about misery and poverty. I'm here to tell you a story of one particular community, Zevri, in Emirati, a village just like I described before, that somehow managed to make the transition. Just, uh, 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 you know, the interesting thing about Zevri, as you can see it on these pictures, is that when you look at it from the outside, it looks actually very much like any other community, any other village in the, in the area. So not much changed from the outside. But the kids, the kids that are coming out of this school today, they're able to continue to colleges and universities in Georgia, and not only in Georgia. They're able to achieve great things. They're able to win uh, prestigious prizes. And for, in just three years, they went from zero or almost zero enrollment rate in higher education and colleges to almost 100. So I'm here today as an economist to tell you about this story because in a way, in many ways, it challenges all the established narratives of development. It challenges the ways in which we think about the role of government in development. It challenges the ways in which we think about the role of donors in development. And probably most importantly, it challenges the ways we think about our own role in development. And m above everything else, it's a story of great hope. Change is indeed possible. Now, the story of Zevri is a serendipity. It's a little miracle. It happened when, in 2011, Kathy McLean and Roy Southworth, two Americans, decided to build their house in Emirati, in Zevri. Now, Kathy is an educational uh, psychologist, and she's been working for years in Western Georgia with children that had development problems. So when Roy retired from his job as a World Bank country director, he was a country director for Georgia, they decided to build a base in Emirati from which they can operate. And they picked Zevri purely by chance. And as it often happens in, in Georgia, when a foreigner comes into your community, what happens? They start getting invited to parties. And in particular, they get started invited to big parties, weddings. And so, as Kathy tells me, by about the third wedding she attended together with Roy, they noticed a very interesting pattern. And the pattern is that the bride is very young, early teens, 15, 16, about to drop out of school. In having the great hearts that they have, they decided, hey, we got to do something about it. And so they engaged their friend, Rezo Chincheladze, 
And they started talking to people in the village. They needed translation, as you can imagine. And the, one of the first people they talked to was the school principal, not surprisingly, Manuchar Panchuladze. They spoke to the guy, all of them, and figured out that a solution may be a small scholarship. A small scholarship covering the cost of tuition in a public university or college. What they didn't, what they didn't figure out is how much a difference it can make, how big a difference this little scholarship could make. And so, in spring 2012, MAC scholarships were introduced. Now, MAC, for those of you who don't know, stands for McLean Association for Children. And these scholarships were introduced, as I said, in spring 2012, a little bit late for children to actually register for national exams, but nevertheless, two kids uh, were able to benefit immediately. Now, the, the scholarship was of this size on purpose because it fully covered the, uh, the cost of tuition, and it was also equal to the size of government grants. There were four conditions attached. Every child in Zevri was eligible, but they had to meet these conditions. The first one, naturally, you have to attend. You have to graduate from, from your school. The second condition is you have to pass national admission exams well enough to be admitted into a college or a university. And there were two other conditions which may surprise you. You see them behind me. One was not to smoke, and the other one was not to get married. These two other conditions, as I was told, were introduced at the insistence of Manu Chiarapanchulidze, the school principal. Now, as of the second year of the program, they realized that they have to do a little bit extra. And they, they realized in particular because the, sc the school was still the same school and the teachers were the same teachers, they have to bring better internet to the school. You know, internet is in fact a great substitute. There is a wealth of knowledge available online, so why not make use of it? That was one. And it's also very cheap. The second thing they did, they, again, as I said, they couldn't touch the school, they couldn't touch the curriculum, they couldn't replace the teachers, of course. So they decided to act on the extracurricular level. School finishes early, so there's plenty of time to do other things. And so they started engaging kids in drama lessons, in sports, in baseball. They bought a lot of equipment. They have, by now, a pretty good team, box, and, and, and whatnot. The highlight of the activity became, I believe, in the third year, a summer camp. By now, the summer camp brings together almost 200 kids from all over Georgia and international kids as well for joint activities in Zevri. So Zevri becoming the capital of Emirati in, 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 in this way. So to, to do all of that, of course, they needed help. And so they engaged professionals, teachers, coaches, and also lots of volunteers from Georgia and international. I would like to in particular mention Peace Corps volunteers who played a very important role in making this all happen. Together, what they did is expose these kids in Zevri to basically new, completely new role models, show them the beautiful world outside, something to aspire to. Now, to the results. So, as I said, in 2012, only two scholarships were awarded. Two, but as you can see, the, the program quickly gained momentum. The next year, students already had time to prepare for the national exams. They registered, and six scholarships were awarded that year. Next year, it was already 14. Last year, 2015, almost the entire age cohort, 15 kids, went into colleges and universities. What development program could dream of such results? Probably n not any. As we heard today, every project comes with its surprises. Remember that. This project also came with a surprise. From the second year of the project, the scholarships provided by, uh, by, the, by MAC did not have to cover the full cost of tuition at universities. The reason is the kids started working so hard that they managed to pass the national exams exceptionally well so well that they, they qualified for government scholarships, something that until then was totally unthinkable. And this, this was a real surprise for, uh, of, of this project. Incentives do matter a lot. Now, behind these numbers, of course, are amazing personal success stories. 
which I cannot tell you for lack of time, but just give you a little bit of taste of these stories. One is the story of Nika, Nika Zibzivadze, who graduated in, in 2013. So Nika went on to the Caucasus School of Business, which is actually a prestigious private institution, graduated at the very top of, of, the, of the school, went to the US, to Georgia, US, to Savannah College, the first uh, Georgian to attend an all-black college in the US, and did very well there. <laughs> He was later selected as one of only 10 Georgians to represent the country at the United Nations Youth Assembly. Did fantastically well. Uh, the other example that I have is Irakli. Irakli also Panchulidze, who is an arm wrestling champion and also a student at the Medical, uh, Medical University in Tbilisi. One more example is uh, Aleko. Aleko is a very special case because he comes from a very, very poor family background. Poor even by the Zevri standards. And yet he had artistic talent and, and so he managed to get into, in the, into the Tbilisi Arts Academy and today he is studying to become an architect. Now, let us take a minute to reflect on what Kathy and Roy and Mac did and what they did not. I think this is really uh, a, a very important. So what they did, as I said earlier, they changed people incentives. They changed incentives for the kids, they changed incentives for the parents and for the whole community. It's like pressing a, a button, a reset button on people's, people's heads. It's like, you know, giving them hope, something to aspire to, and people start working harder. They start pushing themselves to the limit. They start doing their homework, attending classes. They go online. If something is not available in school, why not go online and, and do it yourself? Let us think about what they did not do. What they did not do is also very important. One of the things they did not do is invest in infrastructure. They did not. If you go to Zevri today, you'll find the same exactly shabby cottages that years ago used to house Soviet construction workers. The walls have a little bit of nice graffiti on it, but not much else. In every other respect, the school still looks very much like this, any other school in the area. They didn't do infrastructure because it's expensive. What else they did not do? They did not engage in something like teacher training, teacher certification, they did not try to change curricula, programs, they didn't do any of that. So what they did not do is two things. They did not do the expensive stuff that typically is the business of donors, international organizations, and they did not do the complicated bureaucratic stuff that is the business of governments. And what they show is that change is possible without using a lot of resources and without bureaucracy. And why this is important? This is important because if you can achieve change in this simple way, it means that it can be achieved by all of us here in this room and by every single individual sitting here, me, you. We can do it ourselves, DIY style. And this is probably the most important takeaway from this whole story. Of course, Mac, Roy, Kathy, everyone else is fully energized by their success in Zevri. They even expanded to other areas. They're now supporting schools in Pankisi, in Svaneti. But in the end, they cannot remake the life of every single village in Georgia. We have thousands of these villages. So we need something else. And think of Peace Corps. Alison Swanson, a volunteer in, 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 in Zevri, is doing a fantastic job. She is there, and actually there are another 50 volunteers of Peace Corps all over Georgia doing amazing things. But there are only 50 of them. And the question is, why don't we have a Georgian version of Peace Corps? Why don't we? Why there is no civil service option for Georgians, for instance, for, instance, for those who study at Georgian universities with full government scholarships? They get paid to study, why not engage them in giving back? the kids of Vake and other upscale neighborhoods in, in, in Tbilisi. And now, Peace Corps and civil service, this is about organizations. This is complicated. But how about every single one of us? Why we are not engaged in giving back? 
And for most Georgians, and there are lots of you here sitting, you are, many of you are maybe one or two generations away from some ancestral village, right? And you probably often go there for big parties, for supras, and maybe also for weddings. But why not, why not engage in, in, in a more serious way? You know, as, as I was preparing for this talk, a friend of mine, a colleague at, the, at ISET, Zaza Tevdoradze, a great mathematician, told me a wonderful story which I found to be totally inspirational and I would like to share it with you in conclusion. The story is, is an old one. It goes back to the end of the Soviet Union days when Zaza was a, was a student in the mathematics department. I'm back to numbers now. Uh, was a student of mathematics at Belize State University. And there was another student uh, studying with Zaza by the name of Gocha. And so one day, their professor calls Gocha and says, Gocha, you know what? There is a village in Hefsoreti called Barisahlo. If you go there to teach in the local boarding school, I'm going to waive exams and, and, and the term paper. You, you, you know, just go there and teach in the local boarding school. And Gocha thought seriously for two, three minutes and then said, you know what, I'll take the challenge. And he went there. He didn't know what to expect. He came to this far away community, as far as you can only imagine, and he is connected with the parents, and the parents started trusting him. And they told him, you know what, Gocha? Do whatever you can. You have a carte blanche. They didn't use carte blanche exp expression, but they basically told him, do whatever you can to make our kids into real men. Just don't kill them. And so Gocha started working. He started from the very basic things, discipline. Kids had to wake up in the morning and come to school at 7 o'clock in the morning. Instead of, instead of math, he, gave them, he told them to do laps, physical exercise around the school. Then, of course, he gave them a lot of math, the school math and the extracurricular math and all the other subjects. Quickly, he turned this Barisahlo boarding school into a math boarding school. Six months, six months passed quickly. Gocha stayed in Barisaklo. He stayed there for three years. And then after three years, as Zaza tells me, a miracle happens. Imagine this. The Tbilisi, Tbilisi, the National Math Olympiad of Georgia, the final third round, Gocha appears with six of his Barisaklo students from Hefsereti. Can you imagine that? I could not. Typically, in the final round of any math Olympiad, you would only have uh, students from the top Tbilisi schools. That's it. And there was Gocha and the six kids from Hefsereti. Change is possible. This is what the example of Gocha shows, and it's really within reach. Each one of us can make it happen. Let me conclude by the following. To bring change as we all want, you need a long-term commitment. It doesn't happen you know, any, any kind of one-off action. You have to commit for the long term. Gocha stayed in Hefsoreti for three years. Mac is committed to Zevri and, and expanding, as, as you heard. This is great, but it's difficult. The good news, however, is once you get into the work of development, once you get changing people's lives, very difficult to stop. It's very difficult to stop. It's so rewarding, it's so emotionally, that you want to do more of it. And this is what I personally discovered when I went to Zevri for the first time. It was exactly a year and a half ago, in the fall. It was a special day. I didn't know about it. The kids of Zevri were supposed on that day to perform on stage of the culture house, the Soviet culture house in Terjola, a nearby town. It was not just any kind of play. It was a, a Lados. A, a very famous play by Nodar Dombadze, a very emotional one, a very dramatic one. And I was there in that culture house, together with everybody, Roy and Kathy, and uh, Zura, uh, Rezo, sorry, and Manuchar, and every, everyone who contributed to the effort. And all the parents, the brothers, the sisters, everybody, the whole community was there in the culture house of Torjola, watching the kids of Zevri performing on stage. It was very emotional, and we all had tears in our eyes. We had tears in our eyes, and we were crying also because of the emotions that came out of this drama on stage. But also, we cried 
Because looking at these young actors, we knew that life is not going to be the same for them. Never. It's going to be something else. And we knew that life would also be very different for everybody in the community. The whole community changed. And finally, we knew there would be great things ahead for the little boy with whom we started the journey today. Thank you very much.